Welcome, and thank you for downloading Movement Christian Church's sermon podcast. Here at Movement, we are passionate about God's Word and helping each other move closer to God. Thank you for choosing to grow with us today. Appreciate it, Bobby. I remember the first time that I met Bobby, uh, I would have been in high school, and Bobby was on a recruitment team for the college where we both attended and uh, I, uh, I saw him on stage doing these, I guess they were pretty silly skits, but I remember uh, just a classic skit, what was it, a stroke, 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 and lighthouse skit, the lighthouse skit, uh, you know, just acting goofy and, and uh, you know, just somebody that I could look up to as a teenager, and uh, I saw that goofy guy and I was like, that's what I want to do, I want to do, I want to be that guy, and so man, you guys got a good preacher here. Uh, and I look up to him uh, very much and so thankful to be able to be here again. Um, and so let me introduce myself. If you, if you hear my vocal cords are a little bit gone, I was at camp this past week with a group of high, sc- high schoolers. Yeah, right. And so just uh, I was the dorm dad, so I'm yelling at these teenage boys, you know, uh, in a good way, you know, like, um, but uh, it just, you know, having a good old time. But my voice is a little gone, but... Um, and I've got my daughter Lydia here, and we're going to camp today. I'm going to take Lydia to, uh, to a junior week there. It's in Washington, North Carolina. Um, but I love the, the song that y'all just sang because uh, it's not a very well-known song, um, but it's, uh, it's one that we sang at Campfire every night this past week for, for our teenagers. And, so it's, and it's perfect for getting your minds and your, your thoughts ready for um, the message that I had to, <clears throat> to bring today. And so... Uh, yeah, so I, he already kind of introduced that uh, that I work with church planters of Eastern North Carolina. It's, uh, I've been on the board for a number of years. What I do as a job, though, is I'm a preacher on, in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, in Kill Double Hills is where I live, and I preach at Sunrise Church of Christ. And so if you're ever on vacation out there, maybe try to slip in there on Sunday morning. Um, but I, I, um, I preach there, been there for about 12 years. And, uh, and I do, I work with a church, I'm on the board with a group that plants churches, and we were privileged enough to be a part of this congregation. Um, it's so important for us to be on top of planting new churches to make sure the message of God is being, uh, is being preached in the world that we live in. I was, I was talking those, to those teens this week in a number of settings, and, and one lesson I was trying to make sure that they understood was that there are so many messages being preached, whether it is you know, not necessarily at a church, but on their phones and at schools and just in their social life, messages, influences, teaching them, and they need to. We all need to make sure that we keep teaching the Word of God, that it's pumping through. And so we think, think that it's important to keep planting churches and keep making sure that this message uh, is, is, um, is being shared and not being ever overshadowed by all the other distractions that are out there. And that's kind of going to be the topic that I discuss today. Um, where do we find truth? It's, it's a desire that we all have, but where do we find it? Before you act on something, before you respond with words or decisions before you follow someone's ideas or subscribe to a way of thinking or take a stance in whatever realm, how do you know that what you've been told or what you believe, how do you know it's true? This sermon comes from a a series that I did uh, maybe last year, and the series was called Orthodox. Orthodox... uh, Basically, the definition of that, I don't know if you use that word in your regular vocabulary, but maybe you'll expand your vocabulary today. I had to look this one up when I was doing it. Orthodox means conforming to what is right and true. It's a good word. Conforming to what is right and true. How do we as people, is that even possible for us to agree on truth? And uh, so we, we were asking the question, is that even possible? And ab- absolutely. Con- conforming to something that is orthodox is, is very uh, possible. We can do that. Um, but this sermon is trying to answer the question, how? How do we conform to what is right and true? How can we know something is true? How can we filter out the distractions? How can we filter out the truth from the lies, the known from the unknown, and we know that not everything falls in those two categories. There's a spectrum of gray 
in this world, but how do we manage that responsibly? Um, today we're going to try and answer the question, how? How can I be confident something is right or true or orthodox? From the moment you were born, your little brains, I know they've grown since you were little, but your little brains have been soaking in and processing information and as your brain learns, it starts to realize, wait a second, there are, there are some things that I've taken in that are true and some things that are not true. When your mom put a plate in front of you and said, these, these green things on the plate, they're good for you, right? And as a little kid, you're like, you trust your parents, you trust your mom, and that you start with trust, and then you put that thing in your mouth, and you're like, there's no way that this thing can be good for me, right? I still have that problem to this day. And I, I, you know, she, she was right and, and everything, but then your brain starts to question things. Can I believe what someone tells me to be true uh, in the small ways and in the big ways? And so here's what we're up against. Your whole life is a constant flow of information and data through all your senses. Everything is being process, processed by your brain. So what you hear and what you see and what you feel and what you can touch and what you can smell and, and, and taste from all kinds of sources, your conscious thoughts, unconscious thoughts. Uh, we, we, take it, we take in so much information and data and our brains work hard to process it. And then we come to understand something to be true. We create a worldview and this is how we see the world. This is how things works. And then someone steps in and tells you there is this glitch in life it's called lies. And it starts to create a confusion. And, and lies, I use that word, but there's lots of different ways that I'm meaning this. Some, some of them are, are bad, just like deception and falsehoods and fabrications and manipulations. I pulled out my thesaurus and just look up lies. There's all these kind of things, but not everything that is not true is devious or intended to be evil. Sometimes it's just mistakes or or misunderstandings or flaws or oversights uncertainties but they're still not true um my point is the human condition leaves us with this limited capacity to knowledge and understanding and so as humans we're stuck we're stuck in this this hard place because our instinct is to know and to understand. You see how we progressed as humanity? We are on a constant search for knowledge and understanding to figure things out, to get the answers, and it's an instinct that we pursue so hard. It's, it's like an addiction. As a, as, a, as a people, we soak it all up, we want more, to the point where we'll start taking in information and it doesn't really strike us whether or not to consider, is this true? We just want to know more, and we'll, especially if we like it, we'll just kind of take it in and repeat it. Or, you know. But Proverbs chapter 15, verse 14 says this. It says, the discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. And as I read that verse, I'd just like to, uh, I imagine a person with a huge appetite, uh, but they're not eating food. What they're eating is information. There's eating up anything they hear, anything that they listen to, the messages with an insatiable appetite. The Bible calls us fools when we feed on idiotic knowledge. But when is knowledge idiotic? That's what we have a hard time. And that's why we fight. And that's why we debate and, and try to sort through these sometimes. And our world is saturated with it. I brought this sponge up here with me. Now, I'm not exactly an object lesson person, which is probably why I chose this sermon, because it's maybe something that will stand out. I didn't know what to do with kind of a, a one and done. So I, I brought an object. This is a sponge. Have you ever heard uh, your brain is like a sponge? Right? Especially when you're a little kid, they say that, you know, you watch a little kid and they just start learning stuff. You're like, wow, their brains are just little sponges. It means that they're taking everything that they're learning and just... They got it. This, it's locked in. Now, as you get older, it seems as though our sponges aren't quite as absorbent, right? Some of you can relate to that. Um, but uh, let's just take a second and, and consider the many things that our brains absorb 
over time. So this is your brain. I'm just going to put it in here to keep it clean. And what I've got here is just a picture of water. And this represents information, knowledge, things that you take in as, as, at life. And so here's the exercise. We're going to start from a very young age. Basically, we start by learning as a baby or a toddler. You learn language. Uh, you learn this is a cup, right? This is a cup. We learned that, right? Th this is mommy, right? This is mommy, all right? You learn that and you take it in. It's like, okay, cool. Uh, this is Paw Patrol, right? You learn that? This is Paw Patrol. Now, anybody ever watch Paw Patrol? Okay, I never have. I have I, I had little girls, and so we watched My Little Pony. Anybody, My Little Pony? Oh, man. Yeah, so I watched a lot of My Little Pony, and in My Little Pony, the theme is friendship. And so here's what my girls learned. You know, like, this is what a friend is, right? This is how you're a good friend. This is, how, this is a bad friend, and, you know, they give you little lessons. This is how you deal with your anger, and this is how you... And as you watch this nice little TV show, you start to gain information about the world, and you, you hear your kids talk about it, like, they'll quote... My Little Pony to their friends or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but you get a little bit of ethical guidance from your TV. And of course you get that from your, from your parents. They teach you things as you go on. You watch mom and dad. And they'll teach you things kind of in a lesson type of setting. They'll also teach you things that they don't know they're teaching you. Right? You, know, you watch them. It's just, they're just soaking it in. It's like, oh, this is how married people talk to each other. <laughs> right? Right? That's what they're, they're learning, whether you're actually teaching them or not. And some, I don't want to get negative, but sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. But you take it in and you think as a kid, it's like, this is just how life is. This is how married people talk to each other. All right? This is how you deal with your money. And this is how you uh, make dinner. And this is how you organize your days. And so they're just taking all this stuff in and you're just learning. You're soaking it all up. Um, and uh, you go to school and you learn stuff from school. You learn your math and your colors and your, your shapes and you learn all these different things. And that all, all that's good. You get your different, you progress in your different, I don't know, harder math and harder reading and all those kind of things. You soak it up. But not only do you learn from your teachers and your classes, but there's also a social life. And what's cool about this is that you've got kids that come in that had a different family. And they start coming, teaching you things that they learn from their family. Oh, that's nice. Never heard that word before. All right. All right. Is that a word to kind of use? And so they start using those words. And you start realizing that not everything is the same from your house that it was in their house. And you learn. You grow. You figure those things out. Um, you go home. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we went home, I went home. I watched afternoon cartoons. Yeah, and so you learn lessons from, from those TVs. Maybe you go home, you stream something, you scroll through your phone. And you know when they make videos, every video that's made is usually designed to influence toward something. There's a purpose they made the video. So without even knowing it, you might be like, oh, that was cool. And you might share a story that you heard. So that means you learned it. You took in information. You, you learned that and you got that kind of thing. And you, you start get, getting messages from all different places. Here's another place you get messages, right in here. Like you start to, to feel things and you start getting messages from your heart. And, and so uh, somebody told you one time uh, that, that that's an okay place to get some information. And, and it is, in a lot of ways, you learn things that you enjoy. You learn things that make you comfortable or uncomfortable. You learn things that make you happy or sad. Things that make you curious. Right? And so you find interest and you start to grow and you learn in those interests and you start to soak things up about yourself. You start to figure yourself out. You explore in friends and technology. You start to develop opinions because someone told you, follow your heart. And you're like, great, that sounds like good. I'm going to follow my heart. This is what I think. This is what I feel. I'm going to go and I'm going to learn from within. Uh, you get a little older and you start to gain some independence. Maybe you're, you're 20 years old now. But uh, let me tell you, your sponge is already pretty saturated, right? It's full of a lot of things over these last 20 years. You've gone to church, right? And you get some information from church, like this is what is true, and this is what is good, God and Jesus and, and these types of things. You, you learn about other religions and other beliefs, and you know, it's poured into you. But you're at this point now in life where you realize, I need to settle in on my beliefs, what do I stand for? What is my purpose? Well, I want to have some conviction. You know, when you get around 20 years old, that's, you, you want to have st a stance in life. And, and, uh, but where am I going to... What is... Of all the stuff that's sitting up in here, what is right? 
What is true? How do I figure? And there's no shortage of options of things that you could choose. Let's just glance around the landscape. You have, you look at your peers and you can say, okay, well, this is what they're passionate about. And I like them. So I may, you know, I've learned from them and I learned from people that I respect. You know, I might go along with what they said. And you, you hear different uh, platforms and you're like, okay, that, I really am drawn towards that. I love the idea of inclusion or equality or you know, some really great um, words and stances and beliefs. And you watch these videos and, and they're, they're great. You like the environment. And it's like, is that going to be my thing? Or it's gonna, is it going to be something that I'm against? Like I want to fight for some, I want to fight against racism. I want to fight against, uh, you know, some kind of cause. And there, there's a lot of those things and there's all kinds of marketing to pull you towards their particular point of view and so you're going to be watching because you're interested now and you want to find where it's where is what am i going to be all about you 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 know you watch someone and say they pick this you know you need to pick this side of 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 the issue they're stupid over there all right and they'll market to you to make sure you know that they're stupid and we're smart and uh and so you watch these videos and it's like they make you get the feels inside and I'm like you watch this video it'll break your heart and you'll just start going so you watch that and you get some more information and you're really passionate about these particular things and then, then you turn on the news and there's news channels they're like they're trying to convince you these this is your stance x y and z is what you need to be all about you flip to the other channel and it says you know what x y and z is stupid and if you like x y and z you're stupid and then you got 200 other alternate channels trying to tell you this is what you need to believe this is what is right and true guys we're covered saturated with all these things that are just being poured into our life over and over not to mention the, the again subconscious values that we're kind of taking in we interpret the world and point it towards ourselves it's like you got to be rich you got to be pretty and you look at yourself you're like i'm not rich i'm not pretty i don't have any value I don't have the things that I think I'm supposed to have or I, I feel these certain ways and you start to develop a worldview about yourself and some of it's lies and some of it's true but you can't figure out how to distinguish between those and your heart gets involved for better or for worse and you start testing all that you've soaked in your life and it's just confusing. All I want to do is to conform to what is right and true but I'm just soaked and I don't know how to distinguish one side from the other. Who can really say what is right and true? We need help sorting this all out and then someone tells you there's one God and he knows all truth or maybe you heard that in church maybe you heard Psalm chapter 147 verse 5 where it says great is our Lord and mighty in power his understanding has no limit and you hear something like that and you're like man if that's true how can I tap into that? At this point, your brain is relatively useless. By that, I mean your brain is just overwhelmed because it's saturated with, distracted, right, with worldly confusion. How can I possibly separate what I've come to believe is right or true with what is actually right and true? And today's message on what is orthodox is going to be very simple. The Bible is the Word of God. I know Bobby and I, so I know you guys know this. The Bible is the Word of God. In theology, we call this bibliology which would, would include things like studying the, the Bible, like where it came from, its accuracy, its uh, authority, the writers who wrote it, and the, the context and translations and interpretations. Uh, and I'm not going to cover all the things that are what makes the Bible the Bible, but if you just trust for a second, it's an amazing study if you go in to study the Bible itself, like where it came from. And why it's reliable, why we believe that it's God's word. But since I'm not going to do all of that today, the rest of what I'm going to say, and I don't know where all you guys are on this. Maybe you're not quite there yet. And, and I understand. I'm glad you're here. And, and it's something you can keep exploring. But just for the rest of the message, if you don't mind, just go along with me on an assumption. Okay? It'll make the message go better for you. Go along with me on this assumption that the Bible is the word of God. That it is accurate and authoritative, inspired revelation from God himself. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive 
through hollow and deceptive philosophies, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Let no one take you captive. This saturation that our brains have to deal with has a way of taking us captive. Much of it, maybe not all of it, human tradition. Not progress, like some might tell you. Not logic, but elemental, spiritual forces of this world. And so, to start with, to answer this question, how can we find what is right and true? Here's what I'm going to suggest for you. Do not be taken captive by the worldly philosophies. I feel like we need to wring out our sponge, our brains, every day. The amount of worldly philosophy that gets poured into us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 says, Do not deceive yourself. If any of you think you're wise by the standards of this age... You should become fools so that you may become wise. I like to think of you should become fools. You should just get rid of it. Get rid of it. Become fools so that you could become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. If you want to learn what is right and true, you got to wring out all the bad sources that have been poured into your life. That's not... It's hard to do, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as I finish here. But how do we wring out the bad sources? Like, for example, some bad sources which include but are not limited to. Let's wring out your heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceptive. Believe your heart, they say. Go with your gut. That can be useful. I mean, God gave us a heart. God gave us a gut. We can, we can use it. We can trust it to a point. Only as far as it aligns with the Word of God. It might, uh, it might have been a little bit more useful to use that philosophy if you lived in My Little Pony. Follow your heart, right? But we don't live... In my little pony, we live in the real world, and so we got to ring that stuff out. It might, it doesn't work the same way here. We got to follow your heart so far as it aligns with God's word. Same thing goes for things like your experiences. A lot of people will take the things they've experienced, and that will be the guide. Again, experiences are very useful. Your dreams, God gives you know, like He gives us dreams. He gives us passions and hopes. The voice in the night, maybe your conscience or something. However, you describe the things that guide us. Those things can be good guides for us at, to a point, but he does not contradict his word. So maybe ring it out and then come to it fresh as you talk, think about your dreams. So those are hard. Ringing out your, your experiences, ringing out your heart, those are pretty hard things to do. Let me give you some easy ones. These are, you know, brainer like this, you could do this today, all right? Ring out bad sources like YouTube. Fox News, <laughs> CNN, <laughs> Netflix, Hulu, TikTok. Joe Schmo, who records a video like in it on his dash cam, and he, man, he sounds so convincing. It's like that dude is passionate. I know, like, but listen, it's for the most part, unless they are speaking from the wisdom gained through the Word of God. Start by ringing it out, and then watch it again. Compared to what God says. Now, if we can manage starting ringing out some of our bad sources, we move forward from there. You've heard me say it a few times. The source for truth and what is right has got to be from God. He's the one who knows all things, whose understanding has no limits. Over time, he has blessed us with exactly what we need, a standard by which we can measure truth, his word, 
the Bible. So we look to it. That's why we come here. That's why we study it. First Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17 says, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is God's inspired word given to us to guide us. But wait, there's more. It's not just the Bible that can guide us. I got one more thing. Not only did God give us his word, but he gave us his spirit. Jesus said before his death on the cross, John 15, verse 26, he says, I will send you the helper from the father. The helper is the spirit of truth who comes from the father. If you're a Christian, when you become a Christian, you receive two things. You receive forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you, you got to ask, if I tell you that, it's like, how do you know that? Where do you, like, I want to believe that to be true, but that, it's not me that I've, I found that in the word of God. That's why I know it's true that when we become Christians, we have forgiveness of sins. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's in Acts chapter 2, 38 and 39. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. That's us. For all whom the Lord God will call. Now, I don't have to tell you that, like, for me to stand up here and wring out a, a, this orange sponge, that's easy. Yeah, I can show you. It's an illustration. But to take it and to wring out your brain from all the sources you've been pumped, that's been pumped into you through life, that's not that easy. I get it. Um, but it would not only be difficult, but it would be impossible without the Spirit of God. In you as a guide and a helper. I'm not asking you to ring this out just because of your own brain power. It's like you memorize this, ring it out, memorize it. No, we got the Spirit of God to guide us, to help us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16 is a really cool verse I want to read to you. It says this. It says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerning they are discerned only through the spirit the person with the spirit makes judgments about all things but such a person is not subject merely to human judgment for who has known the mind of the lord as to instruct him but we have the mind of christ so the spirit offers us truth the wisdom, the worldly wisdom, they, they, they see it and can't even grasp it, can't even fathom it, can't, can't understand it. And it's, it's, not, uh, it's not surprising because without the Spirit, it's, you can't understand things of the Spirit. And it's not like it's hidden, like it's some kind of uh, exclusive or conspiracy, like you've got to find it. It's like, no, it's offered. It's in, everyone is invited to it. But the problem is it's pure, which is confusing to the world. I want to give you one more story as I finish up here. Uh, maybe some of you remember the story when Jesus meets uh, a woman at the well. Meets a woman at the well. And I'm going to read a little bit of that. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Now, this is just a side note, not even where I'm heading. But you can already see in this picture that this woman has been saturated. She's learned some things from life that are false. Of course they can associate. But culture has told her, has poured into her, it's wrong. Right? Culture is weird like that. Verse 10 Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? She, he offers living water and she's like, living water? Like the, the meaning for her is hidden. She can't see what he's saying. Like, what are you talking about? Living water, you don't even have a bucket. She's missing it. And, and, and it's hard for her to see past 
the physical. Like to see, all she sees is the well. And she doesn't see who Jesus really is. Can't hear what he's saying. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. And she's still missing it, right? She's still thinking about water. She's still thinking about the well. Unable to understand living water, having lived in a world saturated with worldly wisdom. Now, she's soon going to come to realize that this man can totally transform her, her poor, confused worldview. Uh, but she's living under the belief that maybe she feels alone because she's collecting water all by herself. Uh, maybe, maybe she feels irreversibly dirty. If you read the story, you'll find that she has, be, because of her five failed marriages, but she believes a lie that she is, she's not alone. She believes a lie that she's irreversibly, irreversibly dirty. She believes that she can't associate with men because she's a woman, that she can't associate with Jews because she's Samaritan. All these things have been pumped into her. All of these lies, a byproduct of being saturated with a worldly perspective. But Jesus is offering her living water to be cleaned and filled with the spirit of truth. Go down to verse 23, and as Jesus says, Yet a time is coming... And has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declares... I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Right? I imagine her eyes just opening. I mean, not just opening metaphorically, but also like literally just wide open. And then she's starting to see for the first time, realizing it's you. you the, you're the Messiah. The one who, are, what she just said, is going to explain everything to us. She doesn't have to wait anymore. She, she can wring out her sponge, fresh start, and then let Jesus fill her, pour living water into her. And hopefully you can understand what I'm putting down here today for you. So can you. So let's try and apply this concept. As life hits you, as a person trying to chase after God and, and pursue him, you're going to be presented with many different questions. You're going to have questions that you think that you know the answer to until someone comes up to you and tries to challenge you about what it is you're saying and believing in, and you say, no, you're, you're wrong, you're mistaken. And like, how can we discover our faulty understanding and let Jesus be our guide Questions like this. You're going to be walking in life and you're going to, be, you're going to come up with this. How, how do I deal with politics as a Christian? How do we approach gender? How do we approach marriage, homosexuality? We're going to have to answer the question, who is Jesus? Do I become an angel when I die? Or, or like, is, is there a hell? And if so, how do I make sure I get to heaven? So many questions. What is my opinion on war? How will this world end? When will this world end? Can Christians drink alcohol? Right? There's like all these different questions and I'm sure I look at a room like this and you guys probably have lots of good answers. But like the woman at the well, we might be guilty of letting the world teach us the answer to life's questions. But that will only leave you confused. And so as I look around and I see you guys have probably a lot of good answers in this room, before you answer questions, before you move forward with truth, what is your source? Have you taken time lately to wring out your sponge, to empty 
the junk that gets poured in? What have you been allowing to pour into your brain to make you have the passions that you have? We go to God's word to find life's answers. Let's not be confused by the saturation we've taken in. I've got up here uh, a little um, a box and it's got these little sponges. And so I thought I'd leave you each with one of these. I want to invite you at the end of the service to come take one of these. And it's kind of simple. I thought maybe you could put it in your bathroom. Uh, go, go there pretty much every day. Put it on your sink. And um, in the morning, take it, run it under the water and just watch it get saturated. Let it get saturated. You can see, imagine kind of the things that we're talking about today where things get poured in and it just gets overwhelmed and it just can't even hold anymore. And after you watch that, just squeeze it out as an exercise. I've got to squeeze the bad sources out. But don't stop there because that's, that's kind of halfway done. Let that be a reminder that you could pick up your Bible and you start pouring in living water that comes from Jesus. And put it back on the sink and do it again tomorrow. It's a reminder to go let God pour into you. And maybe you don't want to get it wet. Maybe you keep it in your car and you use it like a stress ball. But you're like, squeeze it out. Squeeze it out. But don't just squeeze it out. Pour in the word of God. Let it be a reminder not only to squeeze it out, but to pour in Christ. I want to pray with you. God, we thank you so much for uh, the many things that you've done for us. I just pray that as we navigate through this world and as we try our best to pursue what is good, to have purpose and take our skills and just direct them towards your will, we get confused with all the different messages. And I just, I don't know how, just, I don't really know how to wring out my sponge. I mean, I've got so much stuff in there that's junk. And I've been trying to wring it out for years. But Lord, I, I understand that you want me to, to wipe clean and let you be my truth. Then you guide me. Teach me how. Show me how. Give me the, the motivation, Lord, through your spirit. Not only me, but I pray that for everyone here in this room. That we can filter out the junk and just let you be poured in. Help us not to be distracted by this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Movement Christian Church's sermon podcast. Want to learn more about us? You can do that by visiting our website at movementchristianchurch.com or on our app available on iOS and Android devices under Movement MC.